Hey folks, it's time for Frugal Prepper. So people are wanting an update on how the keto diet's been going. So I don't know, like a few weeks ago, I started to have some pain and kind of where my, my area of where the pancreas would be and the liver, um, you know, if I had to say what, from what I know where my anatomy is, um, and the pain was very similar to when I had gallstones and it was also radiating up to my right shoulder and up the side of my neck. Um, and that pain is there's a nerve right there that when that area gets inflamed it pushes on that nerve and causes that uh, very similar to a gallbladder attack when I had a gallbladder before I had it out now after I had my gallbladder out I, I've had in the past a hard time with eating a lot of fats that make me very nauseous but I hadn't had that problem on the keto at all like no problems um, I started to get really constipated and have problems in that area and um, so I, I made an appointment with a doctor, but it took me a while to get in because it's going to be a new doctor again because I haven't seen this doctor in like three years. And that doctor is not even in that office, but there's another doctor. My old doctor is a, an hour and a half away or whatever, so um, I don't work up there anymore, so I need to find a local one again. Um, but um, I went ahead and started taking Oxbile, and I just take one Oxbile tablet uh, before I, about five minutes before I eat and um, and for a while there I kind of restricted back the fat just a little bit more a little bit less and but now at, within two, a couple of days of taking the ox bile like, everything returned to normal everything's been great there's no more pain at all no more like, swelling or bloating no more constipation so really think I just wasn't making enough bile and, and I didn't have a gallbladder to concentrate that bile and put it all out at once and it just kind of builds up and when you're not emulsifying the bile you can feed the wrong kind of bacteria in your gut that make you constipated so um, I think that's what happened when you get constipated that can get way backed up and it, it like right where your duodenum or duodenum however you say that word where, where your small intestine starts at the bottom of your stomach that's where the common duct comes in from your hepatic duct and your cystic duct and they go into the common duct and the common duct comes in right there you can actually back up right there and get an infection and swelling I think it's called colitis or something like that um, but the ox bile solved the problem but I went ahead and went to the doctor anyway even though I have been feeling great for a week and uh, I told him everything that was going on he seemed to think that's probably a reasonable assessment um, he did a whole bunch of blood work or checked all the liver stuff and all that. Um, but, so, um, I actually got a hold of my old doctor, the last doctor visit that I had, and my what my weight was. And I thought I might have been pushing 340. I was actually at 353 on that, or not 353, I'm sorry, 453 pounds on that visit. Um so I was even bigger a little bit than I thought it was. But I don't know, I just kept putting on with the insulin every time I went, 5 to 10 pounds, just every time. Within a matter of a year, I went from the 370, 380 range to 453 pounds. Um, that's what insulin does, is it makes you fat. Um, so when I weighed in at the doctor, and it's the first time I've weighed, since I started keto four and a half months ago, I was at 349 pounds. That is 104 pounds of weight loss. I am down from like a really needing a 6X shirt, but being able to like squeeze into 5X and it being tight to I'm, I'm, I'm loose in a 4X now. And some 3Xs I fit into okay, some are still a little tight. Not tight up in this area, but still around that midsection. Um, and so, but I'm down um, to where I'm this on payday. I'm going to be ordering 44 pants. And the 46s are just way too loose. I might get 42s. And I don't know. Um, I think I'll get a couple pairs of 44s and try those first. Um, so I'm down some significant sizes there, you know. Um, I was astonished that I'd lost that much. I that maybe if I was super lucky I might have lost 60 thought it was probably more like 50 uh, when it, I, it was 104 <laughs> I, I don't know um, 
you know, here I had, I really thought I had times when I was just hitting a plateau and I wasn't losing sometimes. And, but, um, you know, I did the math, you know, that's like 0.7 pounds a day, you know, and that's doable when you're doing mostly one meal a day, you're doing some fast, the longer fasts in there. Um, it, it's perfectly doable to, to burn through that much fat on average a day. Um, so I was really nervous going to see the doctor. Um, it's just, it's just like, I'm, I'm getting ready to go in and they, they, they call you back and there's like this little mentally adrenaline rush because I'm feeling like I'm probably going to have to defend myself, you know. And But once I saw that I lost weight, I was just like on cloud nine. I saw how much I had lost. And, um, you know, and the lady saw me kind of looking at the scale. I'm like, holy crap. You know, is that right? I need to weigh again. Well, I can we double check, you know. And I think she thought I was like upset that I was that heavy. And I was like, no you know, less than five months ago, I was 453 pounds. And she's like, really? Like, what did you do? I'm like, well, I've been on a kind of a higher fat, lower carb diet. I didn't really want to say keto because I didn't want to, I don't know how they're going to react, you know. Um, some doctors are like, keto is just deadly, you know. And so, you know, the doctor came in, he seemed really nice. He's like, well, I, I, he's like, I heard you lost like over 100 pounds in like was it five months i was like well that's about four and a half weeks and um i was like i'm astonished i i haven't weighed before today you know um and uh, you know he kind of asked about it and like i was like well you know I've, I've been on a keto diet you know and it, he just gave like a little like yeah <laughs> you know and i was like oh so he knows what this is and he's not necessarily against it and he wasn't at all. He asked me like the kinds of foods that I eat, and I told him like, I eat fat, you know, I eat lard, I eat butter, I eat fatty foods, I eat meat, but I also eat a lot of vegetables. I eat a lot of spinach, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, any kind of grain, mustard green, collard green, you know. Um, I'll eat any of those stuff, but I was like, I really eat a lot of Brussels sprouts, and I eat a lot of broccoli and cauliflower, um, and I usually have. The fattier cuts of meat, and if I fry them or cook them, I'm usually cooking in lard or bacon grease, you know. I was like, I'm not against some avocado oil or something like that, but that's expensive. And he seemed to think that was okay. Um, so that was all good, um, but my blood pressure is back up again, and pretty high. Um, so it was down, it was doing great, and then it was back up. And I have fought with blood pressure problems since I was a young adult. So I've agreed to go ahead and go back on to blood pressure medicines uh, to try to bring that down. Um, and just from the consistent high blood pressure throughout my life, they did an EKG. And my left heart is starting to show signs that it's becoming enlarged. And, um, you know, it was like, well, do you want to see a cardiologist, have more tests done? I'm like, I don't think so at this point. I want to take the medicines as a Band-Aid, as a bridge to health, right? It gets me by to get healthier. I want to quit smoking. Um, and then I want to test again because, I don't know, my heart's enlarged. Is that because I was 100 pounds heavier? Was it really even worse six months ago? And this is actually a little better. But what we need to do is do the test again after I've gotten some things controlled and, and I've lost even more weight and see if this is getting better or worse, you know. Um, so um, I'm going to go back on the blood pressure medicines and the, the two we were able to agree on because I'm like, well, I'm not really happy with what I've read about that metoprolol. <laughs> so, so the two we managed to agree on was lisinopril and, and lodipine, which I think are probably the least of all evils. Um, and so um, I'm going to do that. But uh, things are going great. I'm still losing weight. I'm still eating. And, you know, even though I've hit some bumps along the road with, with the keto, it doesn't mean that the diet's bad or it's wrong. The truth is, is I have an organ missing, right? And that organ was probably missing because of an unhealthy diet before, and it got stones and it had to come out. Um, but you know, that's a trauma that my body suffered. That's a part that's missing out of my digestive system, a, a very important part. And I'm just going to have to take ox bile to supplement that. Um, 
So, you know, I always say, like, if you hit a bump in the road, you don't want to just be like, oh, I give up on keto, right? My blood pressure went up a little bit. And, and the be the worst one is like, oh, they took my cholesterol, and now it's too high. And it's like, that's great. Like, you have to understand that cholesterol is the great repairer, right? Half your brain's made from cholesterol. Like, every cell in your body is made from cholesterol, Right? And all the cells in your body make cholesterol, and your liver makes like 2,000 milligrams of cholesterol a day. And LDL and HDL are not cholesterol. They are lipoproteins. High HDL carries cholesterol to and from where it's needed, from the liver to cells and from damaged tissues back to the liver to be reprocessed. And those HDLs connect onto the LDL. And it's transporting it in triglycerides around the system. And there's different reasons that your LDL could be high. It could be because your body is in a constant state of decay and it's constantly trying to repair itself. And you're inflamed. It could be because you have a leaky gut and you have damaged LDLs going around that can't be reprocessed by the liver. It could be uh, because your body has healed itself and it's now transporting a lot of cholesterol back to the liver. From, from the damaged spots that it was patching up. You just don't know. Like, cholesterol goes up and down, and, 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 and it, it depends on your stress level. It depends on the damage that's going on in your body at the moment. It, it's not a reliable indicator of anything. It's kind of like, well, cholesterol must cause this heart disease because we see cholesterol in, these, in the arteries of these people that have these heart attacks. And... And that's the same as saying, well, firemen must start fires. Because whenever I see a fire, there's a bunch of fire trucks and firemen around. So if we got rid of firemen, we'd have less fires. <laughs> and all of a sudden, fires start breaking out like crazy, and there's nobody to put them out. And the fire truck was there, but it didn't commit the crime, right? You know, and it's the same way with cholesterol. It, it gets blamed for everything, but it's not the one that commits the crime. It's your sugar. It's eating sugar and having constantly high insulin that's causing the trouble. And so when we tell people, oh, eat less fat and less cholesterol, well, they automatically start eating foods higher in sugars, and they get sicker. Um, I won't go on too much about that. It's just amazing how... People have been so programmed to think about their cholesterol numbers and all these numbers that don't necessarily matter. Even in my case, my blood pressure is high. Why is it high? Is it because I have a disease? I have chronic hypertension? Or I... No, it's not. It's because my body's not healthy in that way. And my blood pressure is exactly where my body needs it to be in order to keep surviving and keep functioning and keep walking. It needs that much pressure to get the blood to where it needs to go for me to live. Why does it need that much pressure? Well, it's probably because I'm still morbidly obese. I lost 100 pounds, but I'm still morbidly obese by any definition. And I smoke. And smoking over time especially damages a lot of tissues. And it makes it, your arteries very hard and not elastic. So I have to quit that, and, and I'm working on a strategy to do that. Uh, things that have helped me quit smoking in the past are M&Ms, peanut M&Ms. When I have that craving, I have a few peanut M&Ms, and it helps me get through the craving. And I've been thinking about that. I don't really want the sugar because I want to try to stay in ketosis and lose weight. But I'm like, I just lost 104 pounds. So if I have to eat peanut M&Ms for a few weeks to get off of cigarettes, and even if I gain a few pounds from that, that's okay. I'll lose it again as soon as I'm off of them. So I'm thinking the trade-off might be worth it. And, you know, I just have to really be careful and watch my diet when I'm not, you know, in between M&M times. We'll just see. Or maybe I can think of something else that'll work, but... That first little bite or two of chocolate when you're really craving nicotine, for me, it really releases the same euphoric feeling that you get from when you haven't had a cigarette in a while and you take that first hit of nicotine. And that kind of gets you through that 
tooth grinding, tightness in the jaw, kind of withdrawal uh, feeling that you have when you quit smoking. Um, it helps break that up so that it's not just consistent and wearing you down. So we'll see what my strategy is, but within the next week or two, I'm going to have to give up the cigarettes. Um, and so what I'm doing in the meantime is trying to go much longer in between smoking them and, uh, you know, trying to get down to just a few cigarettes a day um, and then work towards no cigarettes a day. It'll be a huge cost savings for me, too. Um, and the truth is, as I need them right now because I am addicted to the nicotine. Like, I get nicotine withdrawals. I can have a cigarette. I used to need them just as a crutch to try to get enough energy to stand up and get out of bed in the mornings because everything hurt so bad and, and I was so tired. I don't need that anymore. I have the energy. I have an incredible amount of energy. I feel good. My joints don't hurt anymore. I don't need them as the crutch that they used to be, but I still have that physical addiction. I, I don't need them for the psychological and 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 energy reasons that I used to need them. You know, when I start really feeling bad, and I just didn't feel like doing anything, I have my little pack of 20 friends, they could help get me a little motivation. You know, that and a half a pot of coffee get me going. But I could, could skip the coffee now in the mornings. I, I still have a cup of coffee most mornings, but I don't have two cups. You know, I don't have a great big giant mug. So I have a cup of coffee. Um, but there's plenty of mornings I just wake up and get ready to go to work and I don't have any coffee. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is try to get off of the green fizzy soda. Um, I don't know that that's contributing much to my blood pressure, but I'm just going to try to start drinking more and more water and leave the soda more and more behind. Um, you know, it's got to be better for you. So that's where I'm at with my health. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. I didn't get my body in this shape in a day, and it's going to take time to heal itself. But it is healing itself, and the weight loss is evidence of that, because health, the healthier you get, the more your body's going to return to its normal weight. And one of the things my doctor said to me is, you have to remember that skinny people have high blood pressure too. And it's true, but I, I truly believe that healthy people don't have high blood pressure. So the blood pressure is a symptom of something else. It's not a disease in and of itself. High cholesterol is not a disease. Diabetes is not a disease. It is a symptom of a disorder. It's a symptom of your body not being healthy. Um, and that's an important way to look at things. It's important to realize that you don't go to the doctor with a problem and get a pill that you take, right, that's poison, and if you think pills aren't poison, if your doctor's like, oh, this isn't poison, it's going to help you. Even if it's lisinopril, this isn't poison. Ask him what would happen if you took 100 of them at once. You'd probably die, right? Because it's poison. And, and liquid, or I'm sorry, crystal Drano is poison. But I guarantee if you just ate one little crystal of it a day, it wouldn't kill you. So, <laughs> but it's still poison. But those poisons can have an effect to act as a temporary bridge to get something in line while you're trying to get the health in line that's going to ultimately solve the problem. So you want to choose the least least of all the poisons that you can. But you have to get out of the thought that I have this symptom and that this symptom is of, all of its own. You know, people might be saying, no, like, my neck really hurts right here all the time and having the shoulder pain. And you ask them about the gut, the diet, are you constipated? How many, you know, you ask them that kind of stuff. And they're like, no, no, it's my neck, right? And they don't realize that that nerve right there is all connected to your liver and your small intestine, right? <clears throat> it's all connected, right? It's all part of each other. And so when your doctor pulls a tool out, which is that prescription to treat that one symptom, that's not a fix, it's a temporary solution, and it won't last forever, right? Now, there are some medicines for certain diseases and stuff that are real diseases that people are going to need that medicine forever, but um, most of the medicines that they're handing out, like candy now, 
for treating a symptom like high blood pressure, a symptom like diabetes, a symptom like uh, headaches, a symptom uh, like constipation, or a symptom like not getting enough sleep, a symptom like anxiety, a symptom like depression. These aren't diseases, they're symptoms of an unhealthy metabolism. They're not getting to the root of the issue. And some doctors will say to you, um, well, nobody's going to eat better. Nobody ever does. So we just do what we can with the bills we got. I mean, it's better than just letting them walk around with diabetes. But it's not. People die at the same rate, whether they have controlled blood sugar or uncontrolled blood sugar. They have the same complications, the same amputations, the same kidney failures, the same blindness. It's the same. The difference between the two is not statistically significant, controlled with medication or uncontrolled, right? So um, that's not the fix. And fixing the blood sugar isn't the problem, right? You know, you have to fix the metabolism underneath. It took a long time for me to learn that. We're so keyed up in our society to be like, I have a problem. I want to go get a pill and it's going to fix the problem. And I can keep going and I can have my chocolate cake. I can eat it too, and I can keep doing what I'm doing, and I can keep going to work to make more money and working overtime so that I can buy more stuff to fit in the house that I can't afford, right? Um, there's a lot of that, and uh, we have a problem. We typically want to spend money and solve it or, or whatever, and um, you don't need to, like, add pills. You don't need to add more medications, right? What you need to do is remove sugar, remove wheat, remove inflammatory oils, inflammatory foods like soy, wheat, corn, all right, you remove these things. Once you remove them, everything comes into alignment. And slow, sometimes slower than others, and it just, it depends. It depends on your body how much damage is done uh, as to how fast your weight loss will be. But if you hit a plateau and you don't lose weight, you don't give up. You just keep doing what you're doing. You keep on the keto and it'll happen. I find that I'll have things like my knee have problems for decades, um, you know, at least two decades, um, just clicking and frying in. And sometimes it would really flare up and hurt like crazy. And I would take aspirins and everything else to try to help it. And, um, you know, like I stopped losing weight for a few days, you know, I, I mean, I, I could just tell nothing's fitting looser. I might even be, I'm not sure, I might even be a little tighter. Kind of, I had some swelling in my knee. Like, it's kind of swollen. It feels weird. It's kind of warm. Like, there's a fever in my knee, right? And then, like, one day I wake up, and I'm like, hmm, my knee's fine. It feels perfect now. There's no problems with it. And then right after, like, your body has fixed something, you'll notice a whoosh, right? And, like, some more weight comes off. I don't know how that works. I don't know why. But that's just kind of been my impression. Like, when there's a plateau, it's because your body's busy fixing. And as soon as that – and you'll get hungrier during that time. You'll want more fat and more food. And that's why you're plateau on the weight loss. But then, like, as soon as it's done fixing, you kind of, the hunger goes away. You'll eat a little less. You'll be like, oh, I just have one egg for breakfast. And you'll notice that there's just this whoosh, like the weight starts dropping again. So, I don't know. That's what I've noticed. That's what I think. Uh, you know, I'm no doctor. But from what I could read and understand, that's my perception. <laughs> um, whether it's crazy or not, I don't know. It's working for me. I'm really happy. So, I'll talk to y'all later. I'm going to go to bed now and try to get a good night's sleep because it is a little after 11 o'clock at night. Talk to everybody later.